Streaming live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and everyone out there, how you doing? Welcome into today's program. And by the way, check this out. Uh, today on the program, we have none other than Corey Gallagher. And of course, we're going to be discussing all things video games, and we're going to throw in some entertainment there as well, uh, some news and things like that. So everyone, please just sit back, relax, and enjoy today's show that we have planned for you with a lot of different topics, and it's going to be a lot of fun. We have definitely enjoyed these segments. So with that being said, uh, first thing things first computeramerica.com uh, that's you know kind of what we're uh, all about uh, that's where you'll find our reviews that's where you find past shows future shows uh, any articles that we talk about anything and everything can be found at computeramerica.com after the program listen to us live on IRN but then at the same time hey go ahead and check us out on our website now, uh, and one thing I want to make perfectly clear, uh, yeah, I made this announcement yesterday before we started Computer and Technology News. Uh, it, it bears repeating today. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, when Corey gets on, I'm sure that he will have noticed the same thing as we were preparing for today's show, that uh, the all of the different news publications and news sites and that kind of thing, uh, especially with recent comments by the President of the United States, uh, due to the horrible tragedies that happened in, in El Paso and uh, in Dayton, uh, there were comments made about the relationship between violence and video games. Uh, just like we said yesterday before the news, this is not something that we really plan to tackle. Uh, we have had shows on this topic. We recommend that you go back to our archives and check that out. Uh, we have had gaming psychologists and psychologists and people with uh, with doctorates who are much more qualified to speak to this. And yeah, it's just not something that uh, I think myself and I'm assuming that Corey probably isn't interested in really rehashing either. So if you are hoping to hear that, it's it's been on the front page of a lot of these uh, publications, but uh, yeah, we're just not really going to discuss it. So I wanted to get that out there. And, uh, and hey, why don't we go ahead and, with that being said, bring on our guest, who is, again, none other than Corey Gallagher, who, of course, writes for Pop Bazaar Magazine and uh, many, many other publications, and, of course, is a regular contributor here to Computer America. Corey, how are you doing? Welcome on to Computer America. I am doing pretty good, Ben. Thanks for having me. My pleasure, my pleasure. And, obviously, just to, uh, just to address what I just said, I'm assuming you pointedly want to avoid those topics as well, hopefully, right? Um, I don't really know that you or I have much to say about those topics that has not already been said. Uh, perfect. All right. Perfect. 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 Okay. So with uh, with that being said, we do have plenty of other things to talk about. But before we get started, I always want to ask our correspondents you know, who join us again. Uh, how you doing? Everything going well? You find lots of video games to play lately? Keeping busy? I'm doing good. There's a lot to play out there lately. Um, you know, one of the topics we I'd feel like discussing might be about the Epic Game Store, and I would kind of lead into that. Um, sure. But generally speaking, yeah, there's lots of games to play and not enough time to play them in. Uh, my favorite lately is Fire Emblem Three Houses, a strategy game on the Switch. It's really good stuff. Yeah, no, and uh, that's definitely one of the topics that we have here as well. Personally, uh, ever since that we uh, you know mentioned it last time on the program, uh, it was to be released was the. Um, the uh, League of Legends Auto uh, Auto Battler uh, uh, Team Fight Tactics. Uh, I have been just playing an unhealthy amount, uh, if, if I'm being honest with myself, uh, of that, and uh, I'm really enjoying that. But yeah, and, and of course, that's just one of many games out there that uh, definitely deserve people's attention. Uh, so, with that being said, let's go ahead and uh, talk about the Steam Store, and I'm assuming you you wanted to talk about the Ooblets, I think, is what you were getting, getting at, right? 
Yeah, that's the direction I was heading. Are you familiar with the whole Ublitz situation? It's, uh, I've, I've heard about it in passing, but I'm sure there's lots of people like me who are not completely well-versed in this, so please. Well, I, you know, we know I'm completely well-versed in pretty much everything, <laughs> so I will happily educate you. Um, so Ublitz is a game, an independent game, somewhat similar to, I believe, Pokemon. Uh, it's a monster-catching, raising simulator, so far as I know. And uh, I say so far as I know because, to be honest, it really wasn't on my radar until recently. I believe I might have seen a demo for it at E3 last year when I was there, mm -hmm. but uh, it didn't really get my attention that much. But what did get my attention is the recent non controversy surrounding Ooblets. Now, what happened with Ooblets is uh, originally it was announced that it would release on Steam, that you could pre-order it. And it would go on Steam, you could play it there. But, as has been the case with many games lately, we have discovered that, in fact, Ooblets is going to be an epic game store exclusive. And this is where you push your button under control panel and it goes, dun, dun, dun! <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I, I wish I had that, uh, I wish I had that queued up, but I definitely don't. Uh, but, I, and, and obviously, uh, pre-ordering on Steam is, you know, kind of the, uh, it, it's, it's kind of the way that most games traditionally have been. If you wanted to get a game, Steam was your one-stop shop. Epic Game, you know, the Epic Game Store, we talked about that when it came on the scene and uh, it pulled. Uh, not Well, it, of course, I think had Fortnite with it, but then a couple other exclusives you know, started to come along. And I guess this is just another of that trend. Yeah, exactly. Now, typically what happens with these, with these Epic Game Store exclusives is that Epic, who have a lot of money after Fortnite and Gears of War have done well, they will turn around and go to a developer and say, hey, if you take your game off the Steam Store, make it so you can only buy and play it on our Epic Game Store, we will give you a flat fee. We will straight up pay you this amount of money. You'll also get whatever it sells, but we guarantee that you'll make X amount of money. And what that means is it disconnects the amount that you make from how your game does. So, to rephrase, it disconnects how you uh, how much you make from the reception of your game. If your game isn't good, you still you've still made money. It's great. Mm -hmm. If nobody buys your game, you still made money. It's great. And one of the things that's been happening with Steam is the issue of discoverability, where there are too many games on Steam. Uh, so any given game might get lost. Epic is going for a different route. They are going with the idea that if they curate their store, mm -hmm. only allow certain games on there, and make sure, of course, that these exclusivity deals, that those games are going to come to their store, the games that are on there will get attention. So people are upset. Yeah. Uh, numerous reasons. Number one, people hate change. <laughs> Number two, uh, there are currency issues. I don't think the Epic Game Store takes Romanian currency, for instance. So if you are Romanian and you want to play Ublitz, I'm afraid you are out of luck for the moment. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, if people just you know, it comes back to number one. People don't like change very much. So and and uh, I mean the the obvious thing there is that uh, people pre-order the game and they were I'm assuming somewhat involved with uh, the release of this through Steam and then this was kind of uh, launched on them. Let's see when was this actually uh, announced? This was released uh, July 31st, 2019. So about a week ago. Uh, seems very quick, you know, to kind of say, hey, we're coming to Steam, and then just, uh, you know, just before launch, we're an Epic Game Store exclusive. And my only thing with this, and I, I what little I heard was that uh, the the person behind this, which I think he may have included a, uh, no, 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 that's the whole thing about Eva, but he was pretty snarky about um, people's outrage to this. Uh, whether or not you think the outrage was justified, I, I mean, kind of personally, um, I, I totally understand why they did this. You, you mentioned the issue of discoverability on Steam. Um, yeah, if, if there is no guarantee that, I mean, this company, it sounds like tried to do everything that they could. You mentioned that you saw a demo of them out at E3 last year. Uh, they have been obviously, you know, trying to curate their social media. They have been launching on Steam. I'm assuming that they went through, uh, you know, all the hurdles through that. And they still weren't on anyone's radar. I mean, this seems like the best of, you know, kind of the choices that they had, don't you think? Corey, are you there? Nope, oh, might have lost Corey. That's not good. Mm -hmm -hmm. Oh, there we go. Corey, test, can you hear test. me? One, two, one, two. Hello. You're good. There you go. Fantastic. So, yeah, sorry about that. No um, basically, 
what we've seen from the response to this, people are, you know, outraged. It's that's how the gaming community works these days. People get outraged about things. Mm -hmm. Um, they've said some terrible things about the developer. They've said some terrible things about the Epic game store. And, uh, to me, that kind of reinforces the decision that the developer made to leave steam and go to the Epic game store where they are doing a thing that benefits them directly, where they're not relying on these people who obviously don't mind tearing them down if they don't do exactly what they want. And, uh, they're doing what's best for them. And I can respect that. I especially respect that in the age of crowdfunding where, they could have said, oh, by the way, give us money and we'll stay on Steam. No, no, they took the money that was offered them. You can still play the game. The game still exists. You'll still get it if you pre-ordered. You'll just have to play on a different app, which, yeah. Yeah, and and, and so overall, the game being an exclusive, and I, I, I don't know, this seems almost like kind of like Netflix where um, – you know, obviously things are going to come and go off of the catalog. I'm sure. I'm sure that the Epic Game Store is not going to have exclusive rights to these. You know, for eternity. Uh, eventually, you know, the ex the exclusivity should wear off, like most other IPs. But I, I mean, not everything on Netflix is about being the the best thing or the greatest thing. A lot of it is just, hey, this stuff is good enough. And if it weren't for Netflix a lot of this stuff wouldn't be made. And uh, it sounds like Ublitz was pretty close to the finish line, uh, although it sounds like any kind of continued development might have been in jeopardy if it didn't release to a good reception. Uh, it I hate Epic Game Store, but it seems like they're at least contributing money to the right places. Uh, you know, they, they aren't waiting for that crowdfunding. They aren't waiting for the players to kind of say, hey... Uh, it has to be a smash hit out the door. Otherwise, it's going to be like one of the 98% uh, of other games on the Steam store, which have less than 100 downloads. Um, uh, ben, again, were, uh, yeah. ben, were you playing games back in the 90s? Like, were uh, you, when you uh, go ahead and buy... Back yeah, yeah. Uh, when you go, had to go buy CDs and stuff like that. Yeah, of course. Right. So something you might remember back then is like, say you bought a Nintendo 64 right mm -hmm. and you bought mario 64 and what happens when you beat mario 64 you wait for another game to come out or maybe you read your gaming magazines and you see a game in japan and it looks really interesting but they never localize it or maybe you pick up a new game and it's just covered in bugs and they, they're game breaking and you can barely play it there were a lot of games back then that came out like that now right. here's the thing 2019 we don't have to worry about these things we don't have to worry about if there'll be something new to play. New, more games come out that are worth playing than anybody reasonably has time to get through. Let's be real here. Um, if you go on the Epic Games Store, ironically enough, they will give you free games. This time they're giving you Alan Wake and For Honor. That's a solid 100 hours of games. They're just giving you. You don't even got to pay for it. It's not even a money thing. You don't have to pay for it. So, yeah. localization, localization. Everything gets localized these days. Very few games just stay in Japan. I mean, the ones that are worth playing get localized. They come out in the West. You don't got to know Japanese to play them. That's great. Bugs, bugs get fixed. Games are a service now. If there is a game-killing bug, it's fixed within a day of it being found, usually. So, a lot of issues that we don't have to think about these days. So, what do we think about instead? We have to be outraged about something. A lot, of people, a lot of people get paid if we are outraged. We click on their YouTube videos, we click on their websites. What are we outraged about? Several things. First off, we are outraged about the work-life balance of game developers. The least relevant thing ever. If you don't like the job, <laughs> find a new job. We are outraged about the stores from which we buy our games. Does it really matter which giant faceless conglomerate is getting your money? Not really. You have to to use a different app to play Ooblets. That's what it boils down to. It's not a huge deal. Hmm, things I, like that. We're, yeah. We are seeking things to be upset about these days. I think the industry is in such a good place that we have to actively search for things to be mad about because, again, there's a lot of money in, pe in making people angry. We we have uh, discussed that topic before on other parts of the show where, it, and especially with, uh, with Nathan Evans as well, that... Uh, 
like you said, discontent and anger fuel clicks and engagement because if you say, oh yeah, I agree with that, you know, you'll say it hopefully in your head uh, silently to yourself. It's like, oh yeah, sure, that's okay. But then if you, if you see something that you vehemently disagree with or makes you angry or gets a strong emotional reaction, you're going to click dislike, you're going to comment, you're going to share it among your friends and say, look at this stupid person. Um, outrage culture is definitely where it's at and unfortunately it has a lot to do with social media and I think that there isn't really a company that isn't uh, SpaceX or something like that there isn't really a company that can afford to not have a social media presence and hey uh, the metrics uh, everything's about metrics and when it's about metrics then you have to drive those clicks and uh, making people mad I, I mean the latest one uh, I'm not sure if you heard about it. Uh, it was just released today, and I was just watching a live stream before the show. Uh, a particular personality was getting uh, pretty hot under the collar about it, but World of Warcraft is coming out with their 15-year uh, anniversary. Uh, it's I know, it's been crazy. 2004 to 2019, uh, the World of Warcraft 2020 uh, I'm sorry, the World of Warcraft 15 year anniversary. And what do they do? They're going to have an in game event like they normally do. I think it's going to be like a Deathwing type mount. But on top of that, they have an in game, uh, an in game, or I'm sorry, an in store exclusive mount, which is this Alabaster, or Griffin, or Wyvern, and, uh, or, it's, it's, or I say Wyvern. And uh, yeah, you have to pay like 20 bucks for it. Uh, people are you know, getting very upset on social media, on Twitter, on the on the YouTube video announcing it, that, hey, we pay you a monthly subscription, we have for 15 years, we still pay for this game, uh, and you are still releasing uh, in, in or, uh, store exclusive mounts and things like that, things that you can't get through gameplay, we have to spend even more money on top of what we're already spending to get all of the features that you put out for this game. Uh, the store has been around for checking my clock here about 10 years, uh, probably a, a little shorter, you know, maybe seven, eight years. It's been a long time. And I don't know, people are still getting mad uh, about the store. You think that that would just be, um, you think that would just be a known peeve and people would not be peeved off by it, but they still are. It's weird. I mean, you say it's weird. I don't know if I'd say it's weird. I think uh, I think we have it in our nature to be upset about things. Um, and so, so, certainly, so again, weird, there's a like financial motivation behind making people want to be upset about things. Um, if you get a bunch of clicks on your YouTube videos, you'll get paid. If you get a bunch of clicks on a website, you'll get paid. As we watch journalism itself rapidly start to deteriorate, people aren't really getting paid for high-quality writing or high-quality – investigation anymore they're getting paid and they make people angry and get these hate clicks that's where this stuff comes from uh we're going to the mount situation um the mount exists uh it's on the store if you don't want the mount you probably don't have to purchase it <laughs> well yeah and, and that's always the thing they're always extras they're always cosmetic there's nothing uh actually game changing about it but i guess people like I said i say it's weird you say it's natural uh, i guess i could go with natural people definitely do like to be uh outraged and outrage culture is definitely a thing uh if we could transition this to uh, some of our other topics here and i'm looking through a lot of different ones here uh how about we talk about um uh evo which I believe is, you know, maybe not the same kind of outrage. Maybe it's not the same flavor of outrage. But uh, there's there's problem in par there's problems in paradise. Uh, what's going on with Evo? If you care to explain. So Evo, if you guys aren't familiar, is your big fighting game tournament. It happens once a year. And because it's a fighting game tournament, a lot of companies will announce the new updates and their new DLC and their new entire games when it comes to fighting games. So, mm -hmm. for instance, we saw a bunch of great stuff. We saw updates of Samurai Showdown. We saw a new game from the Undernight series, which is a series of anime fighters. We saw a new game in the Guilty Gear series, another series of anime fighters. But one thing happened that really blew people away, and uh, that was when it was announced that Solid Snake from Metal Gear was going to be in Tekken 7. <laughs> it's pretty exciting, right? Like, you, I wouldn't have expected it. That's a big crossover, yeah. I know. It might even sell some copies of Tekken 7. People love Snake. He's great. Of course. Um. 
here's the thing, though. Don't go out and buy a copy of Tekken 7 just yet, because Solid Snake is not going to appear in the game. Uh, in fact, Ban, Ban, I couldn't know nothing about this. Hmm, uh, yeah, and and that's what I'm reading here that uh, that Evo had to kind of explain, and I'm going to try to find the video here. Let's see, it's, I think I, I'm I'm going to put the video up on the video portion for anyone who wants to see it. But uh, yeah, they test, test, didn't. Still good? Huh? Oh oh oh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? It's just making sure we're still good as far as uh, sound goes. Yeah, go ahead and put that up. Yeah, sure. No, no. Uh, uh, you're definitely good. Uh, I'm trying to find, and you know, the only thing I'm finding is this, uh, is this uh, site right here. Snake, what are you doing here? You know, stuff like that. Um, can't find an actual video because obviously this was revealed during uh, during the event or Evo, which uh, uh, like I said, all about fighting games. Um, I, do you? It seems like a joke. It seems like, um, you know, any April Fool's joke that kind of goes, that kind of cuts too close to home or, or, or hits right. too close to home or, you know, cuts too close. I mean, is this another example of just people getting too bent out of shape over something so small? No, no. I think uh, people are absolutely within their rights to be mad about this because, in particular, David Hayter, the man who voiced Solid Snake, is angry about it. He said that his likeness was used for something he did not approve. Um, in a world where that kind of thing is legitimately, it's, it's valuable, it's real money, yeah, he has every right to be mad, and people have every right to be mad that it, that, that happened. Like, this is, this is an amateur mistake. This is the kind of thing Evo shouldn't have done back in 2009, much less 2019. Yeah, and, and obviously not getting permission is one of the big faux pas that uh, you really shouldn't do. Um, Let's face it, uh, you know, using other people's intellectual property is definitely a, uh, you know, is definitely a bad thing. Uh, getting permission, fair rights, digital usage, that kind of thing, uh, very important. And I'm trying to find exactly where in this video Solid Snake actually pops up. But um, they apologized. They pulled back and they made it very clear that, you know, Solid Snake is not going to be in Tekken. Uh does this hurt Tekken 7? I, I, I mean, obviously, I don't think this, uh, it gets people aware of the game. I don't think this hurts game. Tekken 7 necessarily. I mean, they had their own announcement with new DLC characters and such, and that looked great. Um, I think it hurts Evo. If it hurts anybody, it hurts Evo. Um, again, it was a rookie mistake. Um, people study social media these days. They study PR. It's Honestly, a, it's a massive industry these days. This is the kind of thing you should know not to do. Straight up, this is the kind of thing you should know better than to do. Even if it wasn't necessarily them coming out and saying, hey, Snake is going to be in Tekken 7, it was close enough that somebody, somebody, some higher up should have seen this and said no. Yeah, I, and, well, they didn't. They tried to do something cheeky. They tried to do something fun. And I guess there's the teaser right there if anyone wanted to check that out. Um, you know, a little video playing there in the background where, uh, you know, just kind of references the old Solid Snake games. Um, yeah, okay. So they messed up and looks like they apologized for it. Uh, David Hayter, you know, kind of saying, please not use my voice to promote other games. Um, I they, They've taken it out. How do you come back from this? Do you, do you just kind of say, we're sorry and move on? Uh, Evo, I, I, I'll be honest. I'm not even that aware of evo like i know fighting games i know that there's a huge pro scene around them uh when it comes to you know kind of the the competitive aspect of it uh, there are few that are as competitive as fighting games that's it's, it's definitely a very robust you know kind of thing but i've never actually heard of evo and this unfortunately this is what it took for me to actually sit up and take a uh, you know uh take notice of them this isn't all bad. Like as, as as bad as it seems, this isn't all bad. I think for uh, for the convention itself. I think we know that any public publicity, rather, is good publicity these days, and um, people will forget about this within a week. Guaranteed, there will be something else that happened. I, you know, I, I could bet you, I know it will happen. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody will announce that their game is now Epic Game Store exclusive. We will have forgotten about this Evo thing entirely. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> okay, that's fair. That's fair. So they messed up. Uh, they pulled back. That's okay. And hey, that's uh, that's where we're at now. So uh, one example of outrage culture and one example of uh, justified outrage, I guess, is now what we're at. Let's go ahead and move on to our next topic. Uh, you have a couple of topics here. I'm going to go ahead and spring one on you just to keep you on your toes. Uh, this one is a bit more... Um, all right, so two two kind of uh, two kind of fluffy stories, but I think if I recall correctly, you had good things to say about this game, uh, Journey. And big news came out today, actually, that Journey uh, gets a surprise iOS release. So obviously, anyone out there who did not have a play- PlayStation, which I think uh, it came out for 2012 PlayStation 3, it was a PlayStation exclusive. Um, I did not have a PlayStation. Haven't I've never owned a PlayStation, to be honest. Uh, I never got to play this, but hey, I do have an iPhone. So I'm I, I'm not going to ask you because I don't think anyone out there really knows how this would play on a phone. Uh, you know, iOS, you know, from PlayStation 3 to iOS, as I understand it, it's not... It's not technically a very, you know, quick reaction, you know, kind of game. It's more, it's more of uh, a visual story that you kind of uh, follow the character through. But Journey, uh, do you recall the game? And what do you think about some of these, you know, because this was a pretty big indie game that was released on PlayStation getting an iOS mobile treatment. I'm pretty certain it has a Steam version now too, doesn't it? If not Steam, it's some sort of PC version. Uh, it probably does. I've not been paying attention to it whatsoever. Uh, but uh, Journey is a great yeah. game. No, it's a it's one of those very chill kind of games. The, the gimmick with Journey is that when you play, uh, you will find yourself paired with a co-op partner. The thing is, it won't actually tell you who your partner is. Uh, you can play through the whole game with the same person and not know who they are until the game is done. Or maybe they'll leave. It'll pair you up with somebody else. You'll know who they are either. It'll, at the end of the game... It will tell you every person you played with. And it's mm-hmm. great because you can't communicate. Uh, you just have this experience together. It's one of these uh, non-combat games that were very popular a few years ago. They're easy for any devs to make. And, um, yeah, I mean, it was just it was popular back then. It was a really solid game. It, I don't think it costs much, certainly. So if you're into that kind of uh, artistic, experiential kind of game, then, yeah, give it a shot. Um, as for the iOS version, um, you know, honestly, I kind of fell out of mobile gaming. Um I don't use my phone for games very much. I don't have it on me very often, so just kind of the way things are. But um, I assume if you have a lot of time to play with your phone and do stuff on there, yeah, give it a shot. Certainly. You know, I, and, and, and I will say this. I, I, as long as I have access to, uh, to this hunk of machine that is my desktop computer, um, you know, that is completely for work, you know, for the studio and everything like that. But as long as I have access to this thing, uh, mobile gaming is never going to really appeal to me like it would. But I was traveling last month, and by the way, uh, as much as I never ever look at uh, you know the best mobile games of 2019, the best mobile games of June 2019, uh, man, are is it hard to sift through the the not so desirable games when you are about to take a flight and you're sitting in an airport with with a bad connection and you just need to download something so you can play something uh those articles become lifesavers and uh you know when when it comes time uh i i everyone out there who writes articles about the best mobile games i love you thank you so much for doing that because i got some uh some pretty good ones uh, which I don't have my phone with me right now, so I can't uh, re- really explain which ones uh, which one I got. But still, uh, Journey, by the way, it's on the uh, Epic Game Store. Uh, speak of the devil, uh, so it's fifteen bucks on the Epic Game Store or the new iOS release, which just which was just announced today. Um, and I guess it's uh, let's see, so Journey, uh, let's see, it's out on iOS today. So it was released today as well. Is five bucks, so fifteen on on the epic game store or five bucks on ios uh hey it's uh it it was definitely a different kind of game and it caught my attention because it's not often you see these uh you know yes it's an indie game i don't want to call it triple a by any means but a one of the more popular games from yesteryear getting a mobile makeover that's uh that seemed that seemed interesting to me that you know it 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 wasn't just a, a a a spin-off that is a mobile version of the game, but it's the full-fledged game uh, on iOS, and I thought that was interesting. So, uh, announced today, five bucks. Go check that out. 
Okay, so we have like uh, 20 seconds, Corey. I think uh, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce this next topic, and then when we come back, we'll go ahead and talk about it. Uh, sure. When we come back, let's talk about something that you mentioned. Uh, you were playing a lot. Fire Emblem Three Houses. And uh, yeah, we're gonna talk about the sales numbers, how the game goes. You have the UK sales chart here. Uh, looks like it's doing very, very well. And you know, beats FIFA, which is a long time, you know, first place winner. Um, hey, we're gonna talk about the game, how good it is, why it's selling so much, and everyone, more computer and uh, you know, more gaming news, more stuff like that, more computer America, more Corey Gallagher right after this. Everyone, this stay tuned. But the airfare costs a fortune. Paris? Not much closer, and again, airfare. What about Puerto Vallarta? Let's face it, flying anywhere is just too expensive. Wait, what's this? low-cost airlines with one call to low-cost airlines you'll drastically slash your travel costs we're talking insanely low airline prices to any of your favorite destinations where would you like to go london rome costa rica australia wow that's cheap so why wait call now to learn how crazy cheap it is to fly anywhere in the u.s or international our prices are so low we can't publish them the only way to get them is to call to instantly hear the most amazing best deals on airlines travel. It's that easy. So call now and start packing. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. That's 800-215-4461. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is 32 minutes past the hour. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, if you missed any part of today's program so far, please feel free to check out ComputerAmerica.com. It will have, after the program, our today's entire show with the show notes, any websites that we visit, any games that we talk about, any videos that we show, anything and everything. Hey, can be found here on ComputerAmerica.com. Uh, so if you don't get a chance to listen to us live, there you go. That's uh, it's kind of the second best way. Now, everyone, we continue on. Corey Gallagher, of course, Pop Czar Magazine. Uh, they they provide us with a lot of uh, different c contributors, but Corey's our favorite. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Uh, yeah, we're talking all things video games, and as he mentioned at the beginning of the show, it seems like he's been playing a lot of Fire Emblem. I will say that uh, Fire Emblem is another one of those games that I think uh, everyone's heard of your Zeldas and your and your Mario's and your Pokemon and blah blah blah. But Fire Emblem is one of those that I I can only assume is massively popular in the West. And it's has its very strong following in the East, but Fire Emblem flies under the radar in a lot of releases because it seems like there's a new Fire Emblem every every single year. Uh, which is nothing wrong with that, but it's just something that none of my friends have played. I've never played it. I'm not saying that just because my social circle hasn't played it, that means it's not popular, but it just means that, um, I don't know, it, it doesn't have the mass appeal over, over here, although the sales numbers that you have linked here from Dual Shockers uh, kind of put a, you know, kind of make it go the other direction because it looks like it's doing very, very well. So first off, what is Fire Emblem? And second off, what is Fire Emblem Three Houses? And third off, why is it doing so well? So actually here, yep. that's one, two. Hello, yep, yep. hello. You're good, you're good. All right, fantastic. So Fire Emblem is a series of strategy RPGs. Uh, it's one of Nintendo's heaviest hitting franchises, but it's interesting because for the longest time there, 
uh, we didn't actually see any of those games here. We uh, trying to think of uh, Super Smash Brothers Melee on the GameCube came out, and there were characters named Marth and Roy, and nobody yeah. knew who they were, and that's because they were from Fire Emblem, which is a game series that hadn't come out here. Um, eventually, Nintendo was like, "Wow, these characters are popular. We should probably see if we can make some money bringing them over." Uh, lo and behold, they did. You can. Uh, games are very popular here. Everybody loves them. Um, it does seem like there's one every year, but that's just because they do well. Um, <laughs> and the most recent one, which came out, I believe, last week, uh, was Fire... Or it might have been two weeks ago. At some point it came out. The game is Fire Emblem Three Houses. And the idea is that you are a professor who teaches at a school for military officers, and you choose one of the three houses of that school, much like the Harry Potter series, to lead through both school life and what happens after school. Hmm. Uh, why did it sell well? Because it's really good. Quality sells. So and and well, I guess that's uh, that's what I wanted wanted you to get into uh, strategy RPG. Um, it you know the thing that immediately jumps to my mind is something like uh, uh, Final Fantasy, but of course it, you didn't say turn based or anything like that. Uh, what's what's the gameplay like for anyone out there who maybe hasn't been able to try a Fire Emblem game? Um, the gameplay in Fire Emblem, generally speaking, is you have military units, you move them around a map, have them fight. Uh, it's really focused on strategy and positioning. If you put your characters in the right place, they will win. If you don't, they will die. Mm -hmm. uh, one big feature in Fire Emblem is that when your characters die, they stay dead. They don't come back, which uh, is unlike a lot of games. And it means that if you want to experience the full story, you have to play well. Otherwise, your characters die, and that's that. So that is so and, – and, and sorry to bust in here, but that is such a Western thing that I, I've, I've – I've done I've done games like that before, and it's like if you want the the true ending, or if you want uh, you know uh, this ending or that ending, it's like you have to go online and find out like all right, so turn three you got to do this, turn five you should be here. If turn seven, if this event doesn't activate, then you got to restart and go back to turn whatever. Uh, that is such a Western way to play games that it's it's that there's a precision to it. That if you figure it out on your own, you are a god. But I think a lot of people just look up, I guess, kind of walkthroughs, uh, which are surprisingly popular for these kinds of games. Or I, I guess I should say unsurprisingly popular for these kinds of games. So before uh, you scare anybody off, um, I, I will say that Fire Emblem Three Houses does seem a bit easier than most games of its nature. Okay. Especially because okay. you uh, you have a rewind mechanic. So if you make a mistake, you can pull back and try again. That's so good. don't let that scare you off. Give it a shot. <laughs> Okay. Okay, that's good. So, and and like you said, it was uh, you know Fire Emblem Three Houses is uh, doing very well in the sales. And so, uh, you know, looking at some of these other titles, FIFA, you know, uh, nineteen, and this is just for the UK. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure what uh, the full list is for you know kind of worldwide Europe or even so on and so forth. But for the UK at least, uh, for us to top FIFA. They're kind of soccer crazy over in the UK, and so for Fire Emblem Three Houses, uh, what gives? Uh, I mean, this is uh, this is pretty impressive. You know, I can't really uh, point down why it did so well. Again, I really think it comes down to quality. Um, first party Nintendo game that's actually made really well. Mm -hmm. it, it plays really great. It's a lot of fun. That's gonna sell. It's just how things are. Um, why this one specifically? Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say it has a lot of similarities to the Harry Potter series. I think people like the idea of this school life, being a professor, teaching your students and having them fight. Um, people like that kind of thing, especially, I would guess, in Europe, which is the birthplace of Harry Potter, if I had to guess. But hard to say. Yeah, well, hey, that, uh, that certainly could be uh, some part of it. And, hey, just, you know, good reviews. Uh, just a game that comes out to good reviews is going to be in a better place than a game that, you know, doesn't have the longevity and this one looks like it's been on the top for a couple of weeks now so it's uh you know great great to see it do well i'm hoping the fire emblem uh again while i haven't played it i'm all for a franchise doing well because eventually hey i might want to play it and you know hey i can play back some great games so okay fire emblem three houses you've uh ha ha how many hours would you say that you've uh, that you have gotten out of it um, if I can be honest, it's probably about eighty. Not bad, not bad. And and uh, our Nintendo games and, uh, cool we're not even, sixty bucks. Yeah, oh. uh, I would say there are three paths. Um, each path will take you about sixty hours. So worth your time <laughs> and your money for certain. So so you have some time to go through, and it's uh and this is a Switch exclusive. I'm assuming. 
Yes. All right, perfect. Okay, so there you go. Fire Emblem and uh, F- Fire Emblem Three Houses uh, doing very, very well, and as you said, justified. Perfect. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, talk about some of these other, other topics that I have here. Uh, this one, uh, let's see. I'm wondering how much we can kind of get into without, um, you know, without actually just doing this verbatim. Uh, here's an article. Here we're going to include it in the show notes by Tech Radar. And uh, it's essentially talking about um, N- Nintendo. Hey, we just talked about the Fire Emblem. It seemed like a good jumping off point. Nintendo confirms its plans for Gamescom 2019. If you haven't heard of Gamescom, uh, I believe this is the one that takes place in Germany. I'm, I'm really hoping I have my facts right on that one. Uh, August 24th, uh, I'm sorry, uh, August 20th through the 24th. And uh, Nintendo. It will take place between the 20th and the 22nd. So, yeah, it, it, it's a huge convention. It's uh, about as big as E3, I think, in, in a lot of regards. Uh, yeah, I don't know if E3 was, you know, kind of like the the biggest uh, trade show when it came to video games. And everyone's like, oh, it's getting worse, it's dying, it's whatever. But there's been a lot of excitement about Gamescom over the past... Uh, you know, yeah. actually, it's funny that you mention E3 because that brings up another topic we might want to talk about real quick. Sure. Which is uh, E3 recently got pinned down for releasing the personal details of basically every game journalist who went to their show last year. Uh, You could just, it it leaked, it's floating around. If you are a game journalist who went to that show, your personal information, including your home address, your phone number, your full name, those are all out there now. I had not heard about that. And and I just pulled this random article here from GameIndustry.biz. Yeah, you know, we usually cover data leaks on this show, you know, not uh, not involved with, with video games, but just general data leaks. I not heard about this one. So it looks like 2,800 listings for journalists who attended E3, more than 3,300 of those who attended uh, another. So I guess other conventions and other events like that. Uh, let's see. So full names, job titles, addresses, often work, but some from home, email addresses, phone numbers, and fax numbers. Oh, no, not the fax numbers. I joke. This is serious. Um Man, I, I, do we know how how that kind of happened? Like, did someone just kind of leave uh, the spreadsheet in uh, an open place? What happened? So, insofar as we can tell, they actually had a link on their website to this information in an Excel spreadsheet that was only all it had was a username and password lock. It wasn't even encrypted. <laughs> So, yeah, and, and obviously uh, getting through that, not the hardest thing in the world, and it uh, looks like someone definitely did that, and once that gene is out of the... Like, the only, the only good thing, or it's not as bad as, as let's say, financial, in, in some cases, because journalists, by and large, they want to share their name and their number with the right people. That's the important part. Having it leaked to the general public is not a you know generally a good thing because you don't want to talk to the general public in a lot of instances. But having their names out there, I think they're going to be, I guess, kind of used to their phone blowing up. Hopefully this nothing bad comes to this, but uh it's pretty big. It's pretty big for for uh for an event as big as E3 to to do something so foolish. So it's interesting. It is. It's pretty bad. Um, if you, I, mean, I, I would not be surprised to see a lawsuit out of this one, to be honest. Um, I'm lucky in that I tend to skip every other year, and last year was a skip year, so <laughs> I'm not part of it, thankfully. But uh, it would be worrying if I was. Yeah, there, there's, uh, there's many of your there, colleagues. There's a, there is a lot of hate and a lot of abuse that goes toward game journalists, and having that information out there is not, it's not good. Yeah, de- definitely. And, and the only thing I, I can say that uh, a lot of these people, like a lot of this information, uh, most likely is available online in one form or another. It's just having it all in one list and easily abusable. Uh, definitely bad. So eh, good luck with that. Uh, but now getting back to the, uh, you know, uh, the Gamescom uh, real quick and what Nintendo is planning. They said that uh, Nintendo will have a booth there and it will be possible we could, we could get our hands on titles including the Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, uh, Luigi's Mansions 3, and I don't know what's up with Luigi, but he's going through like a, a renaissance with, with like Mario Maker. Uh, just Luigi as a character seems to be coming out from the shadow of Mario. Um, I, I don't know why, but 
they love him. Uh, a new Dragon's Quest, uh, Pokemon Sword and Shield, and of course, The Witcher 3 port, which is interesting because that's a game full of violence, gore, nudity, uh, gratuitous sex scenes, things like that, uh, coming to a console that was traditionally seen as kind of the family-friendly console. So, all that and more, Gamescom 2019. Uh, nothing really surprising there, though, right? Uh, I mean, that seems like what Nintendo would want to talk about Uh None yeah, this is surprising. this is largely what we came what we would expect. Um, yeah, a lot of this stuff is pretty exciting. Um, Luigi is pretty popular, as you mentioned. Uh, he's all over the place why. now. I don't know um, why. <laughs> but yeah, no, no real surprises. Okay, perfect. Uh, yep. So just wanted to run through that one real quick. Let's see. Plenty of other articles that we have here. Another one. Cyber twenty seven. Uh, Cy- Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven has a release date. Uh, I'm not sure if we were you know just talking like fall 2019 or something like that uh but we now have an official release date as far as i know and of course keanu reeves is still at the front of all of this um yeah let's see so uh cd project reds it's a dystopian rpg set in the near future uh hence the name cyberpunk it's uh in 2077 i'm guessing it's going to take place in 2077 uh yeah they said that uh, it's uh the release dates which I thought was later this year, turns out April sixteenth, twenty twenty. They're gonna miss the, um, they're gonna miss the holiday season. I, I guess that's okay. I mean, plenty of games sell during, uh, you know, if it's a good game and it has plenty of attention, it will sell whenever. It doesn't have to hit the holiday season. But I bet you a lot of uh, a lot of other companies were hoping that it would be out in time. So April sixteenth, twenty twenty. Mark your calendars. Uh, it will be available on the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC all at the same time. And they said that it will come to next-gen consoles as well. Uh, think Project Scarlet and the PlayStation 5 as they're both dubbed. Uh, that's Those are not official names, but hey, next-gen port probably coming. And they said it's not being ported to the Switch. So... There you go. Uh, I don't think we need to rehash what Cyberpunk 2077 is, but uh, yeah, I guess the new information here is April 16, 2020. Quarry, what do you think about uh, that? It's pretty exciting. Um, This is one of the bigger games people are very excited for. Um, As you might imagine, every news site on the internet that does does games is reporting on every little scrap of information that comes out about this one, because it's going to be big. Um, I think one way or the other, it'll be pretty big. Oh yeah, no, it, it it's definitely going to be big, and um, honestly, uh, after seeing what happened with, uh, it, even though it's an RPG, and I don't want to compare it directly to things like Destiny, but uh, whenever one of these big new IPs kind of come out, they are a lot of fun. They're, they're tons of fun. As much as, you know, a new sequel, a new Halo, uh, a new Call of Duty, a new Gears of War comes out, and you're like, oh yeah, this is great. A uh, completely new IP can be fun just because it's fresh. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping for a lot. I think a lot of people are hoping for a lot. Uh, okay, so with that being said, uh, let's see. So how about for our next article that we talk about, uh, take a little deviation from video games and talk about, well, uh, although I guess Spider-Man and Venom had their own video games at one point. Uh this is more pop culture, and I'm not sure how big of a fan that you were, Corey, of Venom. You know, Venom the movie. Uh, it, personally, I did go see it in theaters. I liked it a lot. Uh, the main character, I'm trying to think. He he was uh, he was that uh, he was that wrestler that turned into an actor, and he actually did really really well in the movie. Uh, I, I, uh, Tom Hardy, there we go, uh, Tom Hardy, and he did really well in Venom, uh, the, the anti-hero looked really good on screen, uh, it was a fun movie, looks like Andy Serkis, yes, the one that played Gollum, is actually confirmed as Venom 2's director, so I don't know if you have any kind of interest in Venom or movies or things like this, but uh, what do you think of Venom and Andy Serkis? I mean, he's directed a couple of things, but we mostly know him for his CGI motion capture expertise. You know, I have to say, and it's kind of embarrassing, uh, the last Marvel film that I saw was uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, the first one. Um, I went to a, went to a drive-in theater and saw it there. Um, 
and that's the last I've seen of any of the Marvel movies. Um, I'm told they've been great. I've told Venom was pretty okay for what it is, but I have not seen it. As for Andy Sarkis, uh, he played Gollum. That, yeah. That's pretty great. <laughs> yeah, and, and and I think that's it. Uh, he was also uh, like really the main villain in, or one of the main villains in black panther as well you know where he didn't play motion capture whatsoever he played himself and i think that was very interesting that a lot of people uh saw his face but then they were all like i don't know who that is that's uh that's just some random person because hey uh when it comes to andy circus if uh if he doesn't look like uh if he doesn't look like Gollum or if he doesn't look like uh the character from planet of the apes then you just won't re- you won't or uh, caesar from planet of the apes then you just won't recognize him but uh now he's getting his uh, director chops, and yeah, he's uh, he he's gonna try it. I'm I'm hopeful for this. I'm I I think that he's a really good actor, and he knows motion capture inside and out. Uh, hey, in these Marvel movies, what isn't motion capture? So let's go ahead and drop that one there. Uh, have you heard about? Let's see. Uh, have you heard about this game? So Control. I have not heard about this. I saw this when I was looking for articles and things to talk about here on the program today. Uh, Control seems to be one of those games that uh, that popped up here and there. And it looks like it was a hotly, and this is according to Tech Radar and the article here, it's a hotly anticipated action adventure from Remedy coming out later in August. And the good news is that the recommended specs for PCs has actually been toned down considerably since the original very steep requirements were released. And I think that's where kind of the, uh, that's where, I don't want to say the outrage because we've used that word a lot today, but that's where kind of some of the notoriety for this game first was released. Uh, Corey, before we get started, your PC, I'm assuming that you're running something pretty beefy. You know, you, you're probably no slouch in the hardware department. Um, I have an RTX 2080. It does the job. That's pretty, that's pretty darn good. Uh, you can't really, well, I mean, you can ask for a TI founders edition, but Hey, what are you going to do? Uh, mm-hmm. so, and, and so, but for here, they said just to run the game and this is minimum specs. This is not recommended or even, uh, you know, kind of the top tier of it to even run the game. Minimum specs. You needed a GTX 2060 or I'm sorry, a GTX 1060, which is, uh, you know, kind of still last gen, but still kind of current gen uh, graphics card. Uh, and an Intel Core i5-7500 processor, which by the way, I think I'm running like an i7-7900. Uh, so like I barely make the cutoff and my computer is pretty beefy. Um, and, and they said that you need at least an NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1080 Ti to meet its recommended specs. Uh, and as we all know, in, when it comes to video games, um, yeah, recommended specs are not max specs. Like you're, like you are running an RTX 2080. Uh, that's probably what you're going to need to run this game uh, well. So, so yeah. So control, uh, control is the latest game from Remedy, and Remedy is known for narrative games like Alan Wake, which incidentally is uh, free on the Epic Game Store right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, the most recent game was Quantum uh, Quantum Break, which was a big selling point for the Xbox One back in the day. And um, now Control is again, it's something similar. It's this combination of a narrative game and a shooter. And yeah, um, it is. It was pretty graphically intensive, so we heard. Um, Control is what was kind of the secret reveal for 505 games at E3 last year. Um, mm-hmm. I went to go see Bloodstand and uh, Underworld Ascension, and they showed me Control. So <laughs> that was pretty exciting. <laughs> um, and so far as I can tell, you play as a woman with psychic powers who battles alien forces, and the alien forces might actually be your PC if you don't got enough hardware for it. But um, anyway, yeah, it sounds like they've uh cut down the requirements a bit which is definitely a good thing and i'm I'm not surprised that would happen when the game gets close to going gold they have a better clue of what it will run on right and it stands to reason that maybe they'll have to you know turn things down a bit and that's fine so one thing that it looks like here and this is something that uh we've talked about with Darius jerk shawnee another correspondent of ours uh this has to do with ray tracing um and i 
think we've talked about ray tracing on the show here with you before. Anyone out there who does not know, it's uh, the way that light ref uh, reflects off of certain surfaces. So if it's metallic, uh, you know, instead of it just kind of having that dull sheen, like, you know, maybe think old Halo Master Chief armor, uh, you will actually be able to see... Uh, you know, other elements of the game reflected onto a metallic or glass-like surface uh, adds another level of realism because obviously if there's a big explosion, a, a, a big fire blast uh, near a window, ideally you should see the fire in the window as well as the fire itself. So it's like twice as much, uh, very, you know, very computationally heavy. But it looks like this game is going to have that feature. It's going, it's going to have ray tracing. Therefore, I think that's why the minimum specs were so high, was that they wanted to make sure that you could have ray tracing on while you play the game. Uh, the reason that I think that they stepped it back down was because you could turn it off. And hey, the recommended settings became much lower because you don't need ray tracing. Um, I... I, I, I'm assuming that's what all of the hubbub is about because ray tracing is very new. Not a lot of graphics cards can actually run it. You do need one of the RTX cards from NVIDIA to run it. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it looks like they're trying to push the envelope and it, uh, it pushed too many people's buttons. Yep. Uh, still good? Test, test? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, you're good. You're good. Great. Okay. Ray tracing is uh, it's a very graphically intensive process. And honestly, with a card that can do it, even still, I'm definitely going to go with it's not really worth the power it takes to use. But so it goes. Um, if you can turn it off, then yes, that will drastically reduce the amount of power it takes to run the game. That's just how it is. They, um, For reference, they released a version of Quake 2. Um, a couple months ago that ran with ray tracing and my 2080 for all the good it did me, uh, could barely run it. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and that's, uh, and that's definitely a thing. Uh, ray tracing is a new technology with the latest RTX cards. Uh, it's still being worked on, still being perfected. And at this point, there's not a lot of game studios who are actually developing for it because, um, you know, Core Counts himself is one of the lucky. Not many people have an RTX card. Uh, if you make a video game that takes advantage of this, you know, of this new process, uh, you are designing uh, this feature for only a very small segment of the gaming population. So there you go. Uh, let's see. So some other articles here. We have like two or three minutes. We can breeze through these real quick. Uh, Mortal Kombat 11. If you uh, if you're still aware of that game. They said that the, or at least the, the developers are throwing up their hands and saying that hackers have taken over the leaderboards and a string of alleged DDoS attacks, uh, which are distributed uh, denial of service attacks, has put a single player on top of the leaderboards on PS4. That's right. So there you go. Nether Realm Studios is aware and... I guess they're, uh, you know, they said that they're able to capture and exploit their opponent's internet protocol. They then target those individuals with a sudden DDoS attack and the bad traffic streaming into the home router forces their opponents to disconnect from their match, rewarding points to the hacker by default and boosting their ranking. Uh, pretty common. I've, I've heard of this before where you force your opponent to disconnect and looks like they're doing it for Mortal Kombat 11. Uh, Man, if there was ever a reason not to get in trouble, I would think Mortal Kombat 11 would be one of them. Yeah, absolutely. I'm right there with you. Um, you know, I played Mortal Kombat 11 quite a bit of it, in fact, and it was on PS4. So um, I guess this just makes me glad that I'm not playing ranked because uh, that's terrible terrifying um when you implement a system like this where it punishes people for disconnecting this is mm -hmm. the kind of thing you run into um if something can be exploited it will be it's just yeah. how it is yeah looks yeah. looks like it and they mentioned that uh, it even occurred on twitch as well um you know live on twitch for uh you know, for that to happen so let's see so there's that one uh we're done with control we also have uh the story here about master chief collection update it shows off ultra wide support so for those of you who are not familiar with ultra wide support uh, yeah, they, um, they're monitors that are like two monitors stuck together. Uh, the display resolution is something ridiculous, like 34 by nine or something like that. Uh, and it looks like, uh, the Master Chief Collection is going to be, uh, is going to be debuting that. So it will have support for that. Uh, Master Chief Collection is of course, Halo 1, 2, 3, Reach, pretty much every Halo game remastered with better graphics and it looks like there's a couple of bugs as well but 
hey, Master Chief Collection is expected to be released by the end of 2019. It was released on Xbox in the Microsoft Store. Now it's going to be released on Steam, which is, I guess, kind of the big announcement there. Uh, Corey, we just, you know, I had one more story about uh, Stadia, which, hey, maybe next time we'll come back and talk about Stadia in the state of that. But, Corey, we're just flat out of time. Uh, hey, what do you got going on there? Uh, any new reviews coming out? What are you writing? What are you working on? I am working on a review for the newest game in the Age of Wonders series. That's Age of Wonders Planetfall. It just came out today. If you're into that kind of game, you should take a look. It's actually pretty good. Uh, spoiler alert. Uh, also, we'll be talking about Metal Wolf Chaos XD, the most American game ever created. <laughs> uh, aside from that, um, later this month, we've got some Japanese stuff like Crystar coming out. But that's what I've got at the moment. Very, very cool. Looking forward to that. Of course, we'll include a link to all of your writings uh, over at the Well Read Mage and, of course, Pop, uh, Pop Zara. Uh, Corey, until next month, thank you so much. This was a lot of fun and uh, look forward to talking to you again. Sounds great. Thanks for having me. All right. Have a good one. And everyone else out there, thank you so much for tuning into Computer America. Until next time, have a great day. Thank you, thank, thank you. Have a good one. Bye, everyone. <laughs>